out of night. Our problems are just so light compared to who you are. But from this side of the tapestry, these things look terribly heavy to us. And I'm glad that we have you who can speak healing and can speak resolution. And we bring these people and these situations into the throne room of the Almighty ask that you would just simply be what is needed in each case. We will be very careful and very vocal about giving you praise for that. I uh, pray that you bless those families that have lost loved ones. Be what they've lost. Replace them in the hearts of these families. Bless our study tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, We're going to spend some time the next couple of weeks talking about dealing with toxic people. Um, the Apostle Paul, every book he wrote, I think there were 14 books with his signature, either in the beginning of it or throughout the text of it. And he wrote to Christians about two classes of people. He wrote to Christians about other Christians. This is how you treat one another. He wrote to Christians about lost people. This is how you treat lost people. And everybody in here, we're all old enough to have crossed paths, and quite possibly we have been this person in our past. Toxic. Poisonous. Um, attitudinal death. And in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, we're going to start there chapter 6 beginning with uh, verse number 12 a naughty person now that sounds like a, a, a child oh you're naughty well the word naughty there means worthless it means man of Belial so we're talking about a pretty bad guy here a wicked man and the word wicked there means breaking up all that is good this is a toxic person we're talking about here. Walketh with a froward mouth. No, he shoots his mouth off. He winketh with his eyes. He speaketh with his feet. And he teacheth with his fingers. Um, did you know approximately 58% of all communication is nonverbal? It's visual. Um, if I were to tell Jamie... Jamie, I'm going to buy you a brand new car tomorrow. And then I look at Gord and I go, what did I just tell Jamie? What did I just tell Gordon? I'm not buying a new car. And I never said a word other than I'm buying you a new car, and then I just negated it with my, with my wink. And so this, we're, we're talking about body language communication. And when you're counseling with somebody, don't ever do this. Don't cross your arms like this because that's, you know, I'm not listening to you. What you have to say is none of my concern. So, frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore, his calamity shall come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. These six things the Lord doth hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. Lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. We're talking about toxicity here. Now, look in Proverbs chapter 29, and then we'll get into the types. What is a toxic person? How many are we going to be looking at? In Proverbs, what is that, 29, and is that verse 11? I can see it on my computer at the house, but it's, it's harder to see it here. Um, Proverbs 29. Yeah. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it 
end till afterwards. Um, here, the tyranny of toxic people is pretty pandemic. And well, where did those go? There's supposed to be a fill in the blank there. Okay. Oh, they're up there? Huh? Okay. Well, what, what that says, in essence, is this. Toxic people poison every atmosphere they touch. Um, that, that's okay. It, it was up there, Anna, so we'll just keep going. Um, home school, church, relationships, workplace. A toxic person can ruin every atmosphere. And uh, you can, we were talking today about a, a, a friend of ours that's not happy with where she's working because of the political environment. And it, it's apparently toxic. So, uh, okay. I'll have to change that to black. I didn't. Oh, okay. Anyway, Scripture is rather replete with some nasty people in the Bible. There's some nasty people in this world. There's some nasty people in Wachula. Um, I remember when we first moved down here. There we go. Okay, that's all right. We'll just go to the next one. Um, there were like 64 churches in Hardy County. Well, Hardy County is about that big around. And when we we moved down here, we came down here from Kissimmee, and it was a culture shock. Stores closed on Saturday at noon. And I, we were like, what? You know, well, what? You know, it's just like every block there was a church, and it wasn't like that in Kissimmee at all. And so I said, well, this must be one godly town. Just a, wow, I was impressed, you know. And, and not every church is is a Bible-preaching church. I'm aware of that. But um, that ain't true. I, I found out, oh, wow, that's not necessarily true. And so uh, there was a survey done a number of years ago by the Today Show, and they, they discovered this. And you lay, I, I'm going to be interested in a survey that we can take here. 84% of women and 75% of men responded that they had had a toxic friendship at some point in their lives. So have you ladies ever had a toxic friendship? I'm not talking about just, just a general relationship, but a friend that was just toxic. Guys, have you had people in your life that were toxic? Uh, I have. And so toxic people will drain you emotionally, Financially, if they can, if, if you give in to that, and they will, they will suck. They are moral and mental vampires. They will suck out your, uh, I don't know, your excitement, your, your joy. They're, they're just, they're like mosquitoes. They just constantly drain you. And they, dis, they love to sow discord. They love to create dysfunction. And... In Matthew, look at Matthew chapter 7. We're going to take time to look at these verses because I want you to see what the Scripture has to say about these individuals. Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse number 1, Judge not that you be not judged. Now, I've heard people you know, talk about this, this gay thing. Oh, don't judge. You're not supposed to judge what the Bible says. Well, those are the words that the Bible uses. But what does the word judge mean? Judge does not mean make a determination based on truth. That's not what this word means. What this word means is an opinion based on prejudice. Do not arrive at an opinion based on your prejudice. Can you arrive at an opinion based on truth? Absolutely. And we're supposed to do that, as a matter of fact. And so, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. In other words, if I make determinations on people based on my prejudice, guess what they're going to do to me? Same thing. They're going to make determinations based on, on my character based on that. 
And so with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote? And the word mote, we would call it um, a grain of sand, something that's insignificant. So why do you behold the insignificant problem that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam, and the word beam is rafter or joist. So here you got a rafter in your eye, but you can see clearly enough to check out the grain of sand in somebody else. I said, don't do that. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a rafter or a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So, uh, the truth of it is just simply this. Y'all love relationships. Y'all love friendships. Uh, Y'all love being around people that, that are happy and just faithful, and they, they just, they're not bloodsuckers, you know. I, just, I love being around people like that. And there's, just, there's nothing like being around good friends. I, just, I enjoy that. I love that. I know you do too. But relationships can also bring this. Relationships can break your heart. Relationships can uh, complicate your life. They can just bring all kinds of sadness and depression if, if we allow that to happen. And um, so everybody, you either you have had in the past these kind of relationships or you still do. Or you're going to. I don't know if it's even possible to live life without these kinds of people crossing your path from time to time. What did Jesus say? It is impossible, but that what? You're going to be offended. He said, it's impossible that you're not going to be offended in life. Now, why? Why did he say that? Because of the nature of our species. We're stupid. And, and, and I, I mean that in the kind of sort of way. Uh, we can be rude. We can be arrogant. We can be aggressive. We can be all those things. That's, just, that's the nature of, of humanity. And uh, so the other truth of it is that healthy relationships can turn toxic. And toxic relationships can turn healthy. Have you ever had a bad relationship, started off bad, and you worked it out, and now you're good friends with the person. Maybe there was a misunderstanding. Uh, I don't know what it was, but a toxic relationship can be, can be healed, and a healthy relationship can turn toxic. So, Paul said this in Romans chapter 12, verse number 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, here's the question. Uh, how much lieth in you? How, how passionately do we want to get along with people? Do you, uh, do you look at people and they're different than you? They don't, they're not in the same category as you are and you just kind of dismiss them. They're not very important. Homeless people, drug addicts and, and alcoholics. Yeah, well, they're, they're, just, they're not worth much of anything. As much as lieth in you. Uh, now, that's, that's up to me how much lieth in me to get along with people. That is my, that's up to me. And so I, I'm, not, I'm not in charge of what you do. I'm not in charge of what Stacy does. Stacy's not in charge of what I do. I am in charge of how I respond to what she does. She's in charge of what, how, how she responds to me. And that's the same thing with anybody. Well, you don't know what he said. It doesn't really matter, first of all. All right? And, and I realize that people can say some hurtful things, but it's up to me to respond properly to that and so let's take a look how would you define a toxic person okay okay and, and you know it's coming when you see them you know that and we're going to talk about there are 10 of them by the way 10 different types of people we're going to be taking a look at um maybe Okay, a toxic person uh, is a moving target. And what I mean by that is 
All right. They are really good at expertly deflecting blame or response. Well, this is your fault. If you hadn't done this, this wouldn't happen. And they never take responsibility, even for the things they do that are wrong and blow up. Somehow, it's it's uh, it's the Democrats, it's them Republicans, it's Washington, it's Hollywood, it's my neighbor, it's my wife, it's my husband, it's them youngins. It's always, you know, remember Adam and Eve? Lord, it's this woman that you gave me, by the way, and then Eve. Well, it was this serpent, and he didn't have anybody to blame. And uh, so they're they're good at that. They're good at playing on the goodwill or the guilt of other people. If, you, if you're a person of goodwill, they're going to use you, and when they need you again, they'll try to use you again. All right? So they play on the goodwill of other people. And then there's gaslighting. And gaslighting means that you make other people feel as though they're the dysfunctional ones, they're the crazy ones, they're the ones... That are always running. So if you gaslight somebody, that, that means, and, and I'll tell you where that term came from here in just a minute, but you make them feel it's always their fault. It's always their fault. All right, now, Ephesians. Look in Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians 4, we're going to begin to read verse number 25. Or 4, putting away lying speaking every man truth with his neighbor now let me ask you a question who's he writing this to well there's no need to tell the church this really <laughs> really so it said put away lying speak every man truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another so if i lie to you who am i lying to in essence myself right be angry and sin not. So is there an appropriate place for anger? Yes. But anger, anger is not to be expressed when your personal, when your personal ideas are violated. That's not what we're talking about. Anger is to be expressed when truth is violated. All right? So be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Now what does that mean? I heard Phyllis Diller say one time, me and my husband said, uh, we don't go to bed mad we stay up and fight. <laughs> Verse 27, neither give place to the devil. So what, what does these things do? Gives place to the devil. Uh, now, Ed Brown quoted this to me one time in a way I'd never quite heard it quoted. He said, let him that steal, let, yeah, yeah, let him that, how, do you, how would he say that yeah, no more working with your hands. And I was like, wait, well, Ed, I'm not sure you're quoting that quite accurately. Well, let him that steal, steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. All right, now, um, I find it interesting that he's writing to Christians. He's writing to the church at Ephesus and says, stop doing this. See, they came to Christ. This was the culture. This was the parameters of their culture, their social culture. All of this stuff was normal. You got lied to. That's just the way we do things around here. And, but now when you, when you come to Christ, that is to be peeled off. That is to be cut off. And so why, for instance, do people turn toxic? I know some nasty people. They're just mad at the world. Uh, nothing ever is right. Nothing ever is good enough. And, and they're just always, I, I think they would be real uncomfortable with peace in their life. I don't think they would know how to handle that. And so, uh, there we go. Quite often, a toxic person has this rooted in some kind of past trauma some kind of an underlying, maybe even a mental disorder. Um, something happened in their past. My goodness, I've counseled people. They've, they've carried a hurt and a wound for decades. Something happened to them 30 years ago. Something happened to them in a church. Something happened to them at home when they were a kid. My dad didn't tell me he loved me. I, my dad used to beat my mom up. He'd come home, dot, 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 whatever. 
And um, this, if, if these things are not handled properly, you build your own jail cell with these with anger and bitterness, and you've got the key in your pocket. We had a, a conversation last night up at CPM. One of the guys mentioned something right along this line, and he said, I don't know how to deal with this. And I said, have you forgiven the person? Mm. And said, you're, in a, you're in a jail cell of your own construction. And until you forgive this person, you're, you're locked up in this thing, and emotionally you're going you're gonna to suffer for it. Yes, sir. Not at all. Not at all. And won't answer phone, won't turn to text, that, that, that. Yeah. Now, let me, let me give you an example of a young man that had a really, really bad family life when he was a kid. He could not help any of this stuff. He could help his response to this stuff. Look in the book of Judges, chapter number 11. Y'all heard the story of Jephthah. And Jephthah ironically means whom God sets free. Now, eventually, this young man found freedom from, from his bitterness and his anger. But now, tell me, how would you respond to what I'm about to read to you? Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was a son of a harlot. <laughs> okay, wow. Uh, he, he cut your head off in battle, but his mama was a prostitute. And Gilead begat Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bear him two sons and his wife's sons grew up and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him thou shalt not inherit in our father's house for thou art the son of a strange woman you son of a prostitute then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob which means will restore goodness and he was there gathered and there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him why were vain men attracted to Jephthah? Because he was vain. He was vain. They were, he was like a magnet to draw this stuff. And it came to pass that the children of Ammon made, made war against the children of Israel. And you all know the story. The elders in Jephthah's hometown that he got kicked out of, they called him on the phone one day and said, Hey, man, look, we're, we're kind of getting our brisket handed to us. Could you come back and... And Jephthah's like, really? Y'all voted to kick me out. Y'all were standing on the, the, the street corner when I had to leave. And, and anyway, he did go back and the things got squared away. Uh, but there. He had an abusive childhood. That, that's pretty obvious from the scripture. His mother was a prostitute. Could he help that? No, couldn't help that. His brothers mocked him. He eventually threw him out of the house without a dime to his name, even though he was the son of his daddy. Could he help that? No. What could he help? He could help his response to it. He did have a traumatic childhood. And I would dare say uh, that maybe some folks in here, you had something happen in your childhood that was just, you haven't forgotten it yet. It's still maybe even a hurtful thing. And uh, if you've not forgiven, I would encourage you to do that. But these things leave scars. And quite often, person A can hurt you. And person B gets blamed for it. It's like the guy at work. His, his boss cusses him out and screams at him and, and just really, really treats him bad. And then he goes home and kicks the dog. What's the dog got to do with it? You know, Nothing. But he can't kick his boss, and so he kicks somebody or something that, you know, he could, he could do it without reprisal from that person. And so uh, we, we can't help how other people treat us. There is, would you change the way other people treat you if you could? How many of you think everybody ought to treat us right? Tell you the truth. Be nice to you. Be generous to you. Everybody ought to do that. Does everybody do that? 
No. So what are we going to do? Get mad every time somebody doesn't do that? So what we can do, I can help how I respond to how other people treat me. They can, they can cuss me out, uh, you know, treat me bad. They can steal from me. You ever been stolen from, by the way? Anybody ever steal money from you? Borrow money and not pay it back or, or something like that? And uh, so what, what are you going to do? Well, you going to get mad the rest of your life? Going to refuse to help anybody else for the rest of your life? We can't do that. And so uh, I don't know what exactly is the, the angle here. So what is a toxic person? Toxic. It describes interactions where boundaries get blurred and individuals and their behaviors are felt to be demanding. You don't do what I say, you're going to pay a price. Difficult, challenging, and often even adversarial. Toxic people will confront you. They will get in your face. Uh, and there are several ways to do this. It's not always the fangs are hanging out, you know, and they're going to bite a hole in your neck. That's, that's not always the way these people respond. Uh, but they thrive on conflict. It's almost like they can't stand it if things are going well. They gotta have, if it's not broke, they're going to fix it till it is kind of a thing. And they just, they just look for something to complain about. They look for something to gripe about. And uh, so what happens is you, just, you get skewed. The relationship gets skewed. And they, they begin to just draw all of the energy out of you. And there are people, really. Have you ever seen somebody at Walmart that was this kind of person and you duck down the other aisle? Have you ever done that? I have. You know, well, there he is, you know, and I, I go down to the whatever section I'm not even interested in, but I ain't interested in seeing them. And um, so these, these relationships will just chip away at the, uh, the equality of the participants. And now in a friendship, who is responsible for loving who? You're both responsible for loving one another, right? And so one person in this kind of a relationship here is going to sit on their throne and expect you to come and bring tokens of your love and your friendship. And they're, going to, they're not going to do a thing. They just think that they are, they're deserving of that kind of thing, and they're not. Um, okay, so should you stay or stay away? What, what should you do here? Uh, Ask these questions to answer that question, all right? Number one, does the toxic behavior involve physical or psychological abuse? I've counseled with husbands and wives in that office back there, and I have encouraged them to separate, not divorce, but to separate, because it's like a, a swollen tooth. You need time to calm down. You need time for the inflammation to go away. And during this time, I wouldn't, I, I encourage it. I don't call, just leave them alone because y'all are part of each other's problem. So just let that, let that calm down. And uh, so if it involves physical abuse, what would you tell a wife that's getting beat up two or three times a week? Would you say, well, you made a commitment, for better or for worse, and this is worse. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I do not counsel people immediately to divorce. Right? I think there are circumstances that do allow that. But uh, I, I think that forgiveness and the application of grace will it'll spare any marriage if both partners are willing to do that. Question number two, is the other person willing to take responsibility for his or her actions? I've had men, and it's mostly men, sit in that office right back there and say, my marriage is fine. Hers apparently got a problem. And I'm thinking, okay, I see the problem now. <laughs> That's the problem. And I, honestly, I've had guys say that out loud. 
my marriage is fine. Hers, apparently, has an issue. Question number three is, there it is, uh, is the damage so severe that your relationship will be permanently damaged? Now, here's a question I'll ask married couples. Now, we're not always in a marriage situation here. But I'll ask them, I'll say, let, let's just pretend that your marriage is like a, a steel cable that is covered with rubber insulation. Has this problem just cut the rubber insulation, or has it cut into some of the steel cable? And most of the time, they will say, well, just the insulation. I said, okay, that's a completely different situation. Now, if it has cut into the cable and the commitment is at risk, that is going to require a completely different uh, set of questions and, and counseling situations. Um, but here is number four. Can you ever truly get along with this person again? Has the damage been so severe that you can never look at them the same again? Now, what if it's like a, a brother or a sister? Well, you know, I mean, that's, that's blood. I'm aware of that. Uh, you have family reunions and, you know, things like that. But uh, can you, could you get along with anybody given the grace of God? You could. Now, does that mean if if somebody hurts you financially, let's say they just rip you off financially, are we required to allow them to come back to the same place of trust and honor that they had before? No. Absolutely not. I think that'd be foolish to do that, as a matter of fact. Uh, yes, I can forgive, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to let you walk back in and have the same place of trust and honor that you had before. I'm not... I'm not Stupid enough, you know, to do that. So, no healthy relationship should make you feel this way. That's what they said. No healthy relationship should make you feel physically or emotionally drained after spending time with this person. No healthy relationship should reduce confidence in yourself and your enjoyment of life. No healthy relationship should make you feel guilty for not doing more to solve their problems. And there are people that expect you to solve all their problems. Then, if they're confused about your boundaries or beliefs, if, if it leaves you confused about, well, wow, really, I'm... Should I be faithful? Should I be loyal? Should I be honest? I, yeah, you know, if you're around somebody that causes you to question biblical morality, I think you need to shut that door real fast. Because the, the problem is if the mind gets pregnant with the thought of sin, and if I don't deal with it while it is in its embryonic stage, guess what's going to happen? going to grow it's going to develop into a full-blown thought and and what happens according to james when the mind is impregnated with the thought of sin is it going to give birth it's going to give birth and what will the baby do turn around and assassinate the one that gave it birth read james chapter one he talks about this and uh, so i've got to be careful to to guard my mind we talked about this sunday morning my mind and your mind is private property it's private property it belongs to god it does not belong to me so am i free to think anything i want to think and to do anything i want to do and say no but do we well it makes him look bad when we do wrong because people will say, oh, yeah, oh, you see what that preacher did? I knew all them, all them Christians were like that. And you're exactly right. You know, it's, we represent him. Um, no healthy relationship can make you feel frustrated that your needs and your thoughts and your feelings don't matter. I, I, don't, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you feel. It's not important. It's not significant. Yes, sir.
<laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> Frederick Schiller University. Now, this is not just a mental thing we're talking about here. We're talking about physical health. And this university, which is a German university, very prestigious German university, found that exposure to stimuli that produce strong negative emotions, the same kind of exposure you get when dealing with toxic people caused the subject's brains to have a massive stress response. So, and when you're around negativity all the time, it's going to affect you, not, not just mentally and emotionally, but physically. And so toxic people will drive your brain into this stressed out state. Uh, you, you can never please them. They're always moving the goalpost. Uh, it's like the parent that, you know, tells the kid to make the bed up, but it's never good enough. Well, there's a wrinkle up there. Yeah, well, then straighten it out. You know, you've got a six-year-old that's not going to be able to do it as perfectly as you can. And uh, so they will, they will just stress you out emotionally now there are some types of toxic people and we'll we'll get into one maybe two of them tonight but there's the deceiver and lies destroy a very crucial component of any relationship and that relationship is trust can i trust what you say all right uh luke chapter 16 look in luke chapter 16 verse number 10 luke 16 10 says this he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much so the deceiver and we've all been lied to everybody's been lied to about something um <laughs> it's, a, it's a joke this is a lady comes out and uh, she says, honey, does this dress make me look fat? And he says, does this shirt make me look stupid? Uh, now, all right. Lying reveals a, a very significant truth about a person's character. And if, if they're untrustworthy, they're going to be untrustworthy probably more than once. Uh, there's a, there's a lack of integrity. You're talking about shabby moral standards, and they will lie to you about anything. They'll lie to you. At, they'll, at, my mom used to say that, that people, they climb a tree and tell a lie when they can stand on the ground and tell the tree. And back then I didn't understand what that meant, and it's got a little more sense to it now. But if somebody lies once, they're likely to do it again. If, if, they, if they try to deceive you, they don't trust you. Um, and so there's, there's this guy. Then, deceit. It's, it's a part of a larger context in a person's life. Uh, why would a person lie to you? Okay. Take advantage of, of situation. Uh, what's the ulterior motive for being dishonest with you? It makes you wonder what's behind. And they've got these sealed off secret areas of their life. And they're, they're being extremely dishonest about that. And so a liar really needs to keep good records. I say, who did I? I, I told you. No, no, that was you. I told No, wait. No, no, that, that was Phyllis. You got you to gotta remember well if, if you're a liar. To, to who you said something to. And so deceivers create mistrust and chaos and uncertainty. And every time I hear speak, they didn't hear me around the world. But honestly, I'm, I'm like, really? And when I hear his little press secretary talk, the little Q-tip uh I heard, and I, I think I mentioned this to you, but this just, he said the, the reason that the federal government is paying off student loans is because people are being crushed by their debt. And this is the words right out of her mouth. She said, 
It was a bad bet. So they made a bad bet. And I'm thinking this. Bad bet is your debt. You know? And these college kids that are screaming death to America, after you pay off my student loan, you know, that just, that doesn't sit well with me at all. And so, uh, the deceiver. Then, number two, there's a control freak. Always telling you how to do everything. You can't do anything right. Your hair needs to comb on the other way. You know, it's just, they're just always telling you how to do stuff. Um, and they hold you to impossible standards. Standards that quite possibly they themselves cannot hold to. Uh, they're very critical. They're judgmental. They're uptight. They're invasive into things. They're quick to point out your faults, your shortcomings. You shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have done that. And they always want to win the argument. They can't stand the thought of losing an argument. And they've, they've got to have the final word on things. And so they know what's best for you. You've got to listen to them. And they know how you should do it differently. Don't do it that way. Do it this way. Um, so they are engaged in toxic, controlling behavior. So that's the, there, there's the control freak. Then they often deny that control is their objective. I'm just trying to help. I just, I just want it done right. Now, could that be true, by the way? That could be true. That you can be right at the top of your voice. Which, it, it really doesn't matter how mathematically correct you are. That doesn't go over well with anybody. And so their words and their behaviors are often couch, you know, wanting to be helpful, but quite often, and we've, we've talked about this for years in our temperament series, um, you know, there are temperament types that are followers and temperament types that are leaders, and what are your weaknesses? Your strengths carried to extreme. And so if, if, you're, a, if you're a sanguine, for instance, I'm dominant sanguine, what are, what are some of the strengths of a sanguine? Well, they're, they're people people. You know, they, uh, they, got, they, they love to make people laugh. They love people. Can you, can you carry any of that too far? A sense of humor, for instance. Can you carry joking too far? Yeah, and I know that. Can I be annoying? Everybody in these front rows may answer that. I know I can be annoying. I'm a, I am perfectly aware of that. Um, and so, uh, it, now if you're phlegmatic, what, what are the strengths of a phlegmatic? Ever get excited? Uh, can it be carried too far? They're, they're great procrastinators. Can that be carried too far? Oh, yeah. Um, and you've got your choleric and your, you know, your melancholy that the, the choleric is do it my way now. Can that be carried too far? Well, yes. What about the melancholy? If you can't do it perfectly, don't do it at all. Nobody did it perfectly the first time. You had to learn. You had to learn how to do it right. And so we all have strengths. And, and when you carry those to extreme, you've got weaknesses on your hands. And so uh, let's look at the gaslighter. In 1944, Ingrid Bergman, y'all remember Ingrid Bergman, and Charles Boyer, they starred in a movie in which the husband manipulates his wife into thinking that she was nuts. And he did that by dimming these gas fuel lights in the house, and he told her she was hallucinating. The, boy, the light in the room is going, is dim, what's the matter? Nothing wrong with the lights. And he was turning gas lights down and making her think she was a nutsy one. And so that's where this term gaslighting came from. Um, so the manipulative person leaves you feeling, maybe I am crazy. Maybe, maybe I am always wrong. Is, is anybody always wrong about everything? 
Can, can, you, can you be so used to being wrong that you're surprised when you're right? You know? Uh, and so there's, there's a gaslighter that just makes you feel like you're always wrong. Problems are you because you're always wrong and, and you don't do it right. Uh, there's the angry venter. Proverbs 29, 11. Let's turn, read Proverbs 29, verse number 11. A fool uttereth all his mind. The wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. Anger is appropriate when it is expressed at the right time for the right reason to the right degree. Did Jesus ever get angry? Um, Stacy has a t-shirt. Yeah, she got a t-shirt that says... I'm, I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to be flipping tables or what. Uh, I, I forget. Correct me. Okay, but that that's <laughs> about flipping tables. Um, is anger ever right? Yes. Anger at sin is right. Now, can it be taken to extreme? Yeah. Can you bomb an abortion clinic? No. Absolutely not. That is that is taking that too far. And uh, so, and, and you don't get angry at somebody. I would, can, I would really, really encourage it. Don't be, don't be angry for years. That will eat you alive. Well, you don't know what they did in 1944 or 1962. And you might not even remember. I was Counseling with a couple, but it's been years ago. And uh, he was mad. And he couldn't figure it out. He said, you, you've you been mad? You just, for, I forget what does it, for years or forever, something like that. And she said, you don't remember, do you? And he said, remember what? He said, 14, and I remember the, the 14 years ago, you said I was fat. 14, and he was like, I don't even remember that. Well, I do. She remembered it. That was, the, and that was the issue. She had, been, she had been mad for 14 years because he said that to her. Now, should he have said that? I don't think that was wise at all. He probably should not. He, well, he should not have said that. Uh, but should she have remained angry for 14 years? Now, that robbed her of a lot of, a lot of joy in their marriage. And um, so anger itself is not the problem, okay? Mismanagement of anger is the problem. When you, now fire, well, fire's always bad, really. Is it? When you're grilling a steak outside, is it bad? When it's in the fireplace contained and safe, is it bad? No. Now, when it gets out on the carpet, and starts running up the walls. It's the same fire. It's the same flame. Now it's being mismanaged. Now it's, it's out of control. And so anger can be mismanaged. It can be out of control. Or it can let... You ever, did you ever get angry at your children? We did got angry at our kids. They do wrong. And I would, I would encourage that. Of course, all our kids are gone now. All y'all's are gone. Um, don't spank your kids when you're mad. Or when you're angry, I, I would suggest you not do that. Wait, you know, I think there's an appropriate time when you can hurt a child. They're, they're pretty delicate. And uh, so, but let, we need to learn how to manage this. And the inability to control heated emotions is destructive. It is not constructive. Have you ever said anything in anger? The moment, I mean, you, the moment the last syllable came out of your mouth, you were like, and said that what can you do about it can you take it back you can't take it back what can you do you can ask forget oh that was wrong of me to say that would you forgive me and you know don't let it don't let it hit somebody's heart and stay there for years you know I, I, that's that's just not a wise thing yes ma'am <laughs> mom has to go for a time out Right. 
And it's helpful. It's helpful. All right, it's, yes, ma'am. That sounds just like him. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Right, we're going to stop right there. We've got, uh, we've got several more of these guys to talk about. And uh, I appreciate you. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I respect the fact that y'all are here. I respect y'all. And uh, I appreciate that very, very much. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> How did she respond to that? <laughs> Quit loving me, will you please? Uh, that's, yeah. Right. Well, and I don't understand. It takes a lot of energy to be mad all the time, or to be hateful all the time. You know, it just and I just I don't see how you can survive being mad all the time and angry and, and rude. I, I, and this lady, this person that she's talking about, she's told me enough stories. She has shot herself, her own self, in the foot over and over and then complains about the results you know and I, I've, I've often said if you don't like the harvest you're getting change the seed you're sowing and but she never did do that and mm-hmm <laughs> but you're one of the sweetest ladies I know Right? Gordon? Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
But yeah, she, yeah, yeah, she is just one of the sweetest ladies I know. Uh, Everybody needs a friend like you. <laughs> well, you know, it, there's a time, just like Stacey was talking about, and you did that, dealt with that for, what, over a year? Three years. And yeah, I think she did everything she knew how to do. So, and there's a time when you just need to stay away. You know, that's, that's just the, for your own sake, for your own physical, emotional safety, just seal it and, and go on. Anna? I, I think that's the time to stay away. I do too, because there's some people that, regardless of what you say, they're going to correct it, amend it, disagree with it. For instance, uh, it's eight o'clock. Uh, it's five after. You know, it's 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 two miles down to the store. Uh, it's actually a mile and a half. That it's just they're going to disagree with whatever you say, Jamie. Maybe that's what you were going to do. And that's true. Right? Right? They had, yep. And we're going to get into some Proverbs that are they're graphic, but it's exactly the way things are. Exactly. Uh, thank you all for being here. I appreciate uh, your presence. And I love you all. Um, I do. I love everybody in here. You're, uh, today, today was not a stellar day in my existence. I thought I lost my keys. Uh, went, went home, quit laughing, Anna. I went home, and I've got segments. This, this is this is the part I lost right here. The rest of them I've got, but that is part. Of it. And You know, you know what I'm talking about? Thank you. Well, okay. And I run back down to the church. The front door is locked, so apparently I had my keys when I left the building. I looked, I looked on the sidewalk. I, walked, I looked out in the grass. I, I took my car apart. I looked everywhere. I went back. Anna, even, I drove in the back. She helped look. You know, we were, I was looking all over the place. Drove back to the house.
I've got, I've got two keys to the auditorium now. I got home, I got to the house, and I opened the car door, and I was, I was looking all over, and I said, yeah, I'm going to go back out in the yard. I went in the house. I'm going to go back out in the yard. I, I just, I, they were about 10 feet from my car door. And I don't know why I told you that story, but uh, no, you're not. You're laughing at me. I know. I know I was good. <laughs> anyway, I got them. I got them. They were, 